Claude Dennis Shaw. I go by Dennis, my middle name, and I'm the pastor here at Hilltop United Methodist Church in Sandy, Utah. Methodism was an offshoot of uh, the Church of England. And uh, John Wesley, who was an 18th century theologian, uh, was very, very concerned that the church had lost the average working man, he had a, a working woman. He, had, he was very concerned about that and that the church had become so formal and so much of an institution inside of buildings that he wanted to expand the church. He wanted to make sure that the church reached those people who had not been previous, who were not being reached at the time. It was a function to some extent of the uh, industrial revolution because the agrarian economy, they were moving into the cities and the church in England hadn't built to keep up with it. And um, what he wanted to do was to emphasize what we call grace, this idea of the fact that God loves you and there isn't anything you can do about it kind of thing. And that was, that was probably his foremost uh, contribution to theology. We call it this threefold fullness of grace. Grace goes before you before you even know. You have this instant where you, when you're a believer, you, it, you're, you're justified, you're made whole right there. And then you begin this process of becoming perfect in this world, and I know that's a challenge, but, but we, that's what we believe you can do. Um, what sets Methodism apart from, like particularly Catholicism, um, there's, there's a number of things. Um, one, for example, is we ordain women. Uh, ordination of women is, is uh, part of who we are. Um, we have we, what we hold in common with uh, Catholics and Episcopalians is is that we do infant baptism. Our attitude towards, for example, communion, uh, it's somewhere between Baptists and Catholics. Uh, Baptist, it's a ritual they do, but it's crackers and and grape juice. And Catholics, their viewpoint is uh, this is the this is the body of God. This is the body of Jesus at this particular moment. And ours is more of, it's a mystery as to what's going on. We, we're not sure, it's, it's more than grape juice and bread. Uh, but at the same time, we're not prepared to call it the body of, body of Christ. But I would say to you, the, the primary thing about Methodism is, is the fact that they, it holds this idea of grace and action and tension. It's the fact that if you really are a person of grace, then there needs to be some evidence in your life that that grace has transformed you, changed you in some kind of way. The, Method the, the United Methodist Church talks about its mission is making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It isn't about personal, uh, it's, it's not a personal action, it's a, it's a communitarian action. And so consequently, we, if, you're, if you have this pendulum between individuality and community, Methodists swing over to the idea that the community is very, very, very important. Uh, as far as orthodoxy is concerned, um, that's, um, we, we, um, our, our services are just different. That's all I can describe it. Um, the uh, Orthodox, that's like Russian, Greek, uh, Slavic Orthodox. I, all I really know about them is I've attended a couple of services with them, but I know that they, um, they're, they're very holy, they're very high, it's a very high church, uh, and we're sort of in between, we're sort of a hybrid. We're not overly high church, but at the same time, we're not overly uh, low. It's, it's, not, it's not a praise service at the same time. Um, as far as other Protestant churches, other Protestant denominations, a lot of the differences that existed in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, we've sort of homogenized those. Uh, for example, you talk about Presbyterians. Uh, we, we sort of joke around Presbyterians about predestination. You're not going to find too many Presbyterians in today's world that are going to uh, get overly fixated on the idea of predestination. That's just not where they are in the 21st century. So the differences that used to exist uh, between some of the denominations has gone somewhat away, particularly here in Utah. Here in Utah, uh, I would say to you that of, of the 240 people that we had in there in worship today, probably only about 100 of them were cradle Methodist. The, other, the others were raised Presbyterian, they were raised uh, United Church of Christ, they were raised some other denomination. And, and what, what caused them to find their way here is music, programs, ministry for children, ministry for youth, those kinds of things. It's more, it's more how their heart is fed and how their needs are addressed rather than uh, doctrinal, denominational dogma. That, that's not why they're, 
most of them are not here for that reason. The original term uh, that was used in Oxford in 1730-1732 was actually an insult. The, the, uh, the fellow students of John and Charles Wesley were insulting them by saying, oh, there's John and Charles Wesley, they're Methodists, okay? And what John and Charles Wesley had was this protocol, this series of steps that they would go through in the course of a day. And the, and the, and the steps weren't intended to uh, cookie cutter you into any kind of thing. It was intended to help you become a more uh, devoted to God, to become, to move gradually, step by step by step, into a life of, of, uh, of perfection, a life of, the word we use is sanctification, but you think the, uh, it's more holy, more set apart, and that's, that's and not, not set apart in order to be better than anybody else, set apart in order to respond to God's world. You heard my sermon today, it was about being engaged. Well, Methodism in England, in particular, started as an element of the Church of England. We, the term we use is Anglican. Um, and, and he started it there as a renewal movement. It was intended to be a renewal movement within the Church of England. It was intended to uh, be able to have the Church reach people that John and Charles Wesley had felt had been left out of the overall, uh, the overall story of the Church. Uh, in 1730, 1740, 1750s, enormous numbers of people moved from farms and villages into places like Birmingham, Manchester, London, those kinds of places. And the Anglican Church was slow in um, responding to that by building uh, new churches, new sanctuaries, moving priests, things like that. So you had places in, like, hypothetically Manchester where you might have a location. There were 40,000 people lived in a location with one priest. And so what Wesley was trying to do was to make sure that people in those locations um, could still hear the Word of God, could still experience God's, uh, God's uh, love and grace. Now, he did that in a way where the Anglican Church actually got a little mad at him. Uh, they, they were not particularly happy with what it was that he was doing, although I think now in later years they regret that position. Uh, but nonetheless, he and he would train people like you, like you guys. So uh, he would train non-clergy trained people, non-theologically trained people, to go out and carry uh, God's word to them. If you've ever seen the movie Amazing Grace, which is about William Wilberforce, Wilberforce was a Methodist. And what he was doing in England was trying to help eliminate slavery in England. That's how he did that. The real center, though, of, uh, of the Methodist movement is the United States. It's in North America. Um, Wesley sent teachers over to the North America to be part of the colonies. And after the war was over, um, after the Civil War, after the Revolutionary War was over, uh, there was this need to, uh, to get a different denomination going. So many of the people that were associated with the Church of England had ended up being what we call Tories. They were, they were on the side of the English in the American Revolution. And so they're, they're, they're to say there needed to be an uh, alternative side uh, to that is an understatement. And so uh, Wesley began to send people over that had been trained by him, and they began this movement. And it started in Baltimore in 1784. That's when it started. And it's called the Christmas Conference. And uh, it just took off from there. Um, and, and part of the secret to it was is that he had these pastors, these, these clergy, that, he would, that would be trained, and then they would go into the areas of the expanding West, whatever the West was. Uh, and so you'd, you'd, you'd come to a village that had maybe was a year old, two years old, it would have a Methodist church there. It'd be, that's how fast they would deploy resources. Uh, uh, I think his name is Joseph Wigger. There's a book called American Saint uh, about a man named Francis Asbury. And Francis Asbury was the leading uh, creator of this Methodist movement in North America. And the story that Wigger tells is, is that if you were to go into a tavern in this pre-picture, pre-internet, pre-movie world, 
uh, and walked into the tavern and Francis Asbury was talking to Thomas Jefferson. Um, that you would walk into the tavern and say, who are those two men over there? The answer from the tavern would be, I don't know who the tall redheaded guy is, but the guy he's talking to is Francis Asbury. That, that's how, As, how Asbury uh, got around. Um, the, the, I, cannot, I cannot compliment those early uh, pastors enough because they, were, they, were, they worked for the church. They would go to a place for six, they would work a circuit for six months. Uh, they would do baptisms and marriages on a Wednesday. They would do funerals on a, a Friday. It wasn't all about being in church on Sunday. You, you showed up at church when the pastor showed up. And if that was Tuesday, you showed up on Tuesday. But it was, it was just a tremendous amount of prodigious, prodigious work that they did. By the time you got to the uh, middle part of the 19th century, the uh, Methodist movement was the largest Protestant movement in the United States. Well, our action with that is, is that we are making a public statement about the incorporation uh, of, of this child into the body of the church. We are not making them a member of the church uh, that, uh, that we've done this against their will. Uh, it's a two-part step. It's one, we baptize them um, as infants in order for us to make a public statement that we're going to help nurture them in their own walk. But there is another action that occurs later called confirmation, which is when uh, that child comes forward on their own volition and says, I wish to have my membership move from this preparatory status uh, into being a full member of the church. Uh, we do it uh, in part to remind the congregation that we have responsibilities to this child. Uh, I know that there are, there are denominations out there that they do it in order for salvation purposes. That's not our purpose. Um, we, we, we are not uh, fixated on the idea of an unbaptized child burning in hell or any kind of thing like that. That's not, that is not a Methodist belief. Um, and um, so I, I just cannot emphasize that strongly enough. An unbaptized child is an unbaptized child. So we go back to the issue of John Wesley's viewpoint of grace. God's grace is extended to that child in any way. The, law, the baptism is, is a public statement. It's a ritual we do publicly in order to remind the family that, that they, need some, they have some responsibilities to help with the nurture of this child and also to remind the community called the church that they have some responsibilities to help with the nurture of this child. So that, that's how we, we understand baptism. It's not, a, it's not an action to literally, at that point, cleanse you of sinfulness. That's not the way we see that. Um, there are denominations out there. You, look, you talk, for example, like Presbyterians, and they have like the Westminster Catechism, or the Heidelberg Catechism, whatever, the, whatever those things are. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have a, we're not a creedal church. It doesn't mean that we don't say the Apostles' Creed, we don't say the Nicene Creed, but it's not, a, it's not an absolute hardcore tenet of who we are. Um, we, we call our, you, you'll hear people publish it, they'll actually say, the United Methodist Church is, is a non-creedal church. Uh, and technically that's accurate, although inside of our hymnal there is the Apostles' Creed, there is the Nicene Creed, and so that, that is there for us to uh, try to understand. Now, as it relates to the issue of the Trinity, um, I think with, on that one, if we have 30,000 Methodist churches, we may have 60,000 understandings of the Trinity. Uh, and I would say to you that what I, uh, what I operate from, and I realize in this landscape here, there's a, I'm going to use the word particularity, and I'll, I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, in, in this particular landscape, the, uh, the, in Utah, there is a distinct difference between Father, different Son, different Holy Spirit. Methodists are closer to understanding that in unity. We understand that as is the fact that God is at one and the same time, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, it's, 
were Augustinian in that aspect, Saint Augustine. And that's the way he would draw that up on a chart. He would show that God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. But the Father is different and distinct from the Son. The Father is distinct and different from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is different and distinct from the Father. You ask a question or two a minute ago about orthodoxy. For example, the Orthodox, they, they believe that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and that the, and, the, and the Son comes from the Father, but that the Holy Spirit and the Father are distinctly different. Okay, they are, there's no commingling of that, which led to some of the tension uh, in the 11th century, 12th century, uh, between the Catholics and the Orthodox. For most Methodists, we sort of step back from that and go, King's X, time out, not our fight. We don't, we're not, we're not that doctrinaire. I would say, going back to your, your comment about what we believe, I, if there is one, Catholics uh, are extremely good theologians. I mean, you look, you look, you listen to like Justice, uh, late, the late Justice Scalia. He, he's a layperson. He was a layperson, and he was very, very deep theologically. Uh, you listen, you talk to many people that are Jewish. Um, they may be lay people. They're not rabbis. They're very, 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 very deep theologically. I would say to you that um, that Methodist. By and large, many of us, I'm not saying there are not any Methodists that are not deep, I'm not saying that at all, but, but I would say the nature of what the training and the doctrine and the expectation that we have from our, from our parishioners is, um, I'm, I'm not sure we're doing them any favor by letting them uh, get off as light as we do. We, we sometimes give them their theology on Sunday morning in 20 minute bites. And I'm not sure what kind of theologian you become in 20 minute bite once once a week. But I, um, I think if there's anything that uh, I, I would like to see us as Methodists do is try to figure out a way to go deeper at the same time knowing that God's love is extended to you, even though you may, have not, you may not feel worthy of it. Um, well, covenant services are part of what Wesley, um, that's part of his reconnecting, uh, his trying to get people to reconnect and enter into covenant uh, with God, the community they're in, and themselves, uh, trying to convince, trying to show them that um, they they need to make a pledge. Uh, it's a it's a promise. Covenant means promise uh, that you'll you'll do that. Covenant services were very very big when Wesley got going. Uh, they're not as they're not as prevalent now. Uh, but that having been said, we we do a piece of music here called the Covenant Prayer, and I try to do that Covenant Prayer about once a quarter. And it's right out of John Wesley's 1750 words, which is the fact that we need to put ourselves to work on behalf of God. And so I don't do covenant services per se, but I do, I do remind people of the fact that we are in covenant with God, with each other, with ourselves, in order to be God's hands in the world. Wesley used those as renewal exercises, and uh, I think that was very good. Uh, here, people are, I hate to say busy, but if we were to have them, I'm not sure people would attend them very frequently. It's fascinating in the fact that this church was actually founded in about 1905, 1906, 1907 in Midvale. So it was the Midvale Methodist Church for many, 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 many years. And uh, they were over uh, in downtown Midvale, what is now downtown Midvale, had a very strong connection with the Kennecott Mines. And so there was a lot of families that lived here and their spouses would work up in the Kennecott Mines. Um, and slowly over time, they began to realize that there was a tremendous opportunity for growth further south. Uh, so there was about 70-ish people that were there in Midvale in the late 1970s, and they decided to sell that building, and they uh, did not have this location picked out when they sold the building, and they went on a wilderness journey. I, I use this Exodus imagery. They left Egypt, and they were on the way to the Promised Land, and they had to journey in the wilderness while they were there. And they went through a funeral home, and they went through a storefront and uh, they eventually ended up here. The reason they're named Hilltop is the fact the original location was right behind um, where there's a, there's a track stop over about 98th or so, 98th or, one, or 100th 
or so. And that was the original location. It was up on a hill. And uh, so they, were, they called themselves Hilltop based upon the property they had bought. They ran into some issues with uh, how to use the land. And so they gave the land back to the developer and then bought this property. Um, and in the church, just, the growth just took off. In the mid-1980s, it just exploded. So you went from 70 people in worship to two or 300 in worship. In the mid-1990s, uh, there was 500 in worship. It was, it was extremely, uh, it was extremely well poised for many of the people who came in to Salt Lake for the Olympics. The Olympic, the Olympic, uh, the number of, of workers that came in in order to support the Olympics of 2002 ended up here. They, a lot of them, people who came in from Texas and Tennessee and Georgia and all of that, they came in and where could they go to church? They, they found this particular place. This particular building has grown out in stages. It started off with a highly functional area that was a, a fellowship hall, which included the worship space. And then it grew out to the sanctuary, which you might well see in the film. And then you, they grew out to a school underneath the sanctuary, and then the space over the fellowship hall. So there's been about five or six build outs and uh, those, that, was from the, that was planned from the very beginning. So when they, they moved into the building in 1983, their strategy was to look somewhat like you've got right here. Uh, and they finished the build out about 2010, 20, 2009, uh, and now we're paying off those build outs. But it, um, at, at its start in 1979, when it became Hilltop, there was about 70 in worship in the mid uh, 1990s, there was over 500 in worship, and right now we're in the mid 200s, about 240 in worship. Today we had 239 in worship today. How did I get into the church? How did I get into Methodism? Um, I got into the church in the beginning because I had a drug problem. My wife had to drag me to church, and uh, I didn't want to be a church. And uh, I was an army officer. I was uh, served, I was about the 21st, 22nd year of service, and I was in Heidelberg, Germany. And my wife uh, basically forced me to go to church one morning. She said, you, you, this is part of responsibility of being a father. I don't care what it is you believe or don't believe. Get to church, you're going to church. I'm taking you to church. So I went. And um, you know, you've, you've heard a thousand sermons. I was raised in the church, been away from the church for many years. And um, sometime during that service, uh, God started talking to me. Uh, there, it, I was surrounded by 200 people there in this chapel in Heidelberg, Germany. It was English, it was an American chaplain, an army chaplain. But he was talking to me. And um, I walked out uh, different. And I didn't know what the whole plan was, but I knew that the direction in which I was gonna be leading my post-army life had just changed. It had just changed. I didn't know, didn't know all of it. And so I began the study, I began reading, I began think experimenting. It, interestingly enough, going back to how God provides, um, my boss um, was a, a son of a Methodist pastor. And uh, on Monday morning, he was at church on Sundays. And on Monday morning, after we got our troops doing their various thing, he would come upstairs for a coffee break. He'd have a cup of coffee, and I have a bagel. We both have a cup of coffee. And our coffee break would be spent talking about the previous day's service. We'd unpack it, 10, 15 minutes. And every Monday, I got to where I looked forward to that more and more and more and more. And all I can tell you is, is that slowly over time, it began to dawn on me that I was being called into ministry. And I, and I had to fight past this issue of unworthiness. You know, I'd been away from the church for 20 years. Who, who am I to go be serve, serving God? And the answer was, you're exactly who I'm looking for. You're, it's the fact that you have been away, which makes you uh, more familiar with the issues that are in front. Um, I fell in love with Methodism through John Wesley. I fell in love with Methodism over, the, I was raised very much in a turn or burn mindset. Turn or burn is a terminology, either you have forth faith or you're gonna burn in hell kind of logic. Turn your life around or you're going to burn. That's where the turn or burn comes from. And it always bothered me, I didn't like that. It troubled me. 
and this embracement of this idea of grace that Wesley did, just, I loved it. So then I went, then I started seminary in Washington, D.C. after I got out of the Army, and I loved it. But I kept, I kept thinking to have this idea that I could be like a Sunday school teacher, or I could be a, a church administrator, uh, or those kinds of things. And uh, God kept saying, no, I want you to preach. I want you to preach. It took me, it took me a while to get to the place where I was on God's plan. And um, I've got a little knock or two on my head from trying to do it my way. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm answering God's call. And um, it was hard for me to retire. I'm going to retire this June. I'm 71. And I feel like um, I'm still going to be doing things, trying to help people learn how to be better leaders. But at the end of the day, this has been a wonderful 20 years. I've just loved it. Uh, there's been a day or two where it's really hard. But by and large, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm going about God's work. Served the military for right at 30 years. I've been serving God for 20. So almost my entire adult life has been in some kind of service. So that's how I ended up there was God invited me along and I came along for the ride. So. Well, your question focuses on what's the most rewarding and what's the most challenging. Um, let me give you one answer. Um, it's the fact that at the moments of the greatest joy and the greatest pain, you're invited into people's lives. Um, tremendous, tremendous moments. You know, the uh, moments of weddings, the moments of baptisms, uh, the moments of miraculous cu cures, um, the moments that people um, just want to celebrate the rest of their lives. You're there, you're often there. A, a part of that. Uh, the other time, the other thing, though, is is related to the same element of that is the fact that you're you're also there when they leave this world. Uh, you're and you're so you're there at these moments of tremendous pain. You're there at these moments when marriages collapse. Um, you're there at these moments when families can't be reconciled with their children. Um, and so there's this tension between those two things. And I don't think, you can't have one without the other. They they go hand in glove. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be there at the moments of joy, I've got, I've got a news flash for you. You're gonna have to also be prepared to be there at those moments of pain. Uh, so I would say to you, the um, one of the most wonderful things about this, and at the same time, the most humbling, it's not, it's not like it's, I, I can only call it humbling. I'll tell you a story in a second. But um, uh, it's this willingness, this openness for them to have you be there. My story, and I've done it twice. I've done it twice. I, I don't, don't like I do this every single time. I go visit somebody who's passing away. Uh, but when I, go, when I go visit someone who's passing away, um, I take my Bible. I take my hymnal. I take some oil with me. Important for us to recognize that the people that we're ministering to at this moment, they may not act, they may not be creating the impression with us that they hear us. We need to disabuse ourselves of that perception. We have no idea what they can hear and can't hear. All I can tell you is, is that twice I have felt that people were fighting death from fear. They were afraid to die. And so I went in and sang to them, read them scripture, sang to them some more, read some scripture, talked to them as if they could hear me, and I think they could. I then took some oil and anointed their forehead, and I gave them permission to die. I gave them permission to go. In both cases, within 15 minutes, they had passed away. Everybody I talked to as a fellow pastor has had some experience similar to that, and uh, it's, um, it's humbling. That's the only way I can describe it. If people come out of that and they feel like they're, how powerful they are, they don't get it. It's actually quite the converse of this. It's, it's, it's how powerful the force of God is in the world, and how we are just humble instruments operating on behalf of, of God in that. So 
we, we have two choices. We can, we can exercise our call with hubris, with conceit, or we can exercise our call in humility. It's an either or. It's not a both and. And I would say to you, we have to, my vote, my choice would be to be as humble as we possibly can, just to continue to be fascinated by what it is we don't know, but that we're just instruments of help, helping God's action in the world. Your question focuses on what's going on in greater Methodism, and um, we're we're in tension. We're in significant tension right now. Um, we're a global church. We're we're sitting here in Utah at a place where yes, there's a high concentration of a particular denom denomination, but the LDS is a global church. That's a simple fact. Well, Methodism is a global church. It's like Catholicism, it's, it's global. Our large concentrations are North America, the Philippines, and Africa. That's where our largest concentrations are. Um, we, don't, we don't have a common uh, viewpoint of Scripture. That is the challenge that's facing us. Um, the question is, what lens are you going to read Scripture through? Um, the sermon I gave today. It's this issue of treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. To me, that's the lens of Jesus in the world. Um, the dilemma you've got is the fact that there's also a lot of material in the Bible that is, that is uh, anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-homosexual in orientation, in, in that focus. And um, we're, we do not have a common understanding of how we will understand that. We, have, we understand that and uh, who you welcome to the table, who is welcome at the table. If, if, if North America were left to its own devices, it probably would be about 55, 45, 60, 40 in terms of percent to being more inclusive, moving to a more inclusive church. The dilemma we have is the fact that a lot of the overseas church is, uh, is um, not as inclusive. That does not mean they're, they're pagans or they're savages or anything like that. They just have a different understanding of what this is all about and how it all fits together. And they have an equal, they have a vote at the table. The way, our, the way we're set up, uh, we essentially meet as a house of representatives every four years. And uh, Africa and the Philippines get a lot of votes because they have a lot of Methodists. And so we have to listen and defer. But do I know what's going to happen? No. And they, they may be, as we're sitting here talking right now, we've already reached some kind of conclusion of what, what the direction we're going to go. There's four ideas out there. One's called the simple plan. Uh, the simple plan is just to simply reduce, is to eliminate all of the uh, anti-homosexuality wording in our rules and just just call it even. Just just make those words go away. And that then there's no, there's no discrimination at all. The next one up is what we call the one church plan. And it would be, allow a, 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 a geographical zone to have one policy different than another geographical zone. Or it would allow a local church to be different than the geographical zone. And it would also allow the pastor at that church to have a different view than the church. So, that, that, so you could have what Methodists believe in Maine would be different than what Methodists believe in Southern California. And that troubles some people. There's another proposal out there that would break us up into piece parts that stands almost no chance of being passed. And finally, there's a proposal out there that would take the existing rules and it would make it very punitive. So if somebody did something, uh, allowed a gay marriage in their building, performed a gay marriage, they would be punished very, very severely to include having their credentials removed as a pastor. What's gonna pass, I don't know. I just don't know. It, it, and it may be passing right now as we speak, but um, that's, the, that's the tension that's out there. I think if it were just left to North America by itself, the one church plan, that's the regional, local, uh, personal, local clergy, I think we would move to that, but I don't know what we're going to do. And like I said, by the end of the day, we'll have some idea. But it, the, the primary schism we have right now has to do, the primary break that we have to do right now, the primary um, 
um, Paul calls it in um, uh, the primary division uh, is uh, this potential schism and it's primarily over the issue of homosexuality and how we will be in unity while we don't agree on how it is that we theologically understand that. And I, my brothers and sisters of the LDS are wrestling with the same issue. They really are. They, they, they've got the same problem.